All right, it is about almost 5 p.m. EST, uh, which is um, whatever time we were supposed to be starting. And so I'm Kraken. I'm one of the moderators at BioCord. And today we have Ashby, who is presenting DNA barcoding in corals, Hope Against a Changing Climate. Uh, first of all, I'd like to go over some ground rules. I'd like everybody in the um, audience to keep yourself muted or at least keep push to talk on. And if you have a question, please type it in the chat um, so that it doesn't interrupt the, um, the speaker. I will not be collecting questions because I'm on a laptop and I only have one screen. Uh, so I actually will not be moderating the chat at this time, but somebody else on the mod or staff team will be moderating the chat. And so I'd like everybody to give Ashby a warm welcome. Oh, and I am streaming to YouTube um, if the stream on Discord gets full. Ashby, you're free to start. Okay. So, hi everyone. Um, as Kraken said, I'm Ashby or Ashley. Um, today I'm going to be presenting a little slideshow I put together on DNA barcoding in corals, hope against a changing climate. So a little bit of background before we begin. What exactly is the process of DNA barcoding or DBC for short? DNA barcoding was first defined as, quote, the use of DNA sequences from a signature region of the genome to make species level identifications. This uses a specific five inch sequence of cytochrome oxidase, the subunit one or COI-5. The process involves the production of PCR amplicons from particular regions to sequence them and these sequence data are used to identify or quote, barcode that organism to make a distinction from other species. Researchers are also able to utilize this technique by comparing unknown DNA sequences to a set database of known barcodes or species in this case. What this is good for is it streamlines species identifications and minimizes time and costs for the researchers. So more on the background of corals themselves. Corals are a highly variable type of cnidarian in class Anthozoa. They are primarily in the polypoid stage, meaning that they look more like a sea anemone than a typical jellyfish might. There are two primary subclasses of corals, your hexachorallians, or six tentacle polyps, and your octocorallians, the ones with eight tentacles. They're further divided into two orders, the order Scleractinia, or stony coils, corals, excuse me, and the alacaceas, the soft corals. There are about roughly 6,000 species worldwide, and they can be found at a range of depths, even though they're most famously noted to be in warm, shallow, tropical waters, such as off of Florida, Australia, and in the tropics. But they can be found deeper than 2,000 meters in what we are known as deep coral reefs. A deep reef is defined by a coral thriving at about 50 meters or greater in depth, and these corals are typically characterized by having much larger but fewer polyps, which are more better suited for filter feeding and suspension feeding off of detritus in the depths, which is much different than corals we typically see in shallow waters, which have much smaller but much more abundance of polyps, which are more specialized with symbiosis with their zooxanthellae in order to perform photosynthesis. So there are quite a few issues that corals are currently facing, unfortunately. Many of them are anthropogenic, but some of them are also ecological as well. Um, one of the primary factor, um, problems that they're facing is ocean acidification. So what is ocean 
acidification is, is the process in which the ocean's pH is getting out of balance. About 150 years ago, prior to the Industrial Revolution, the ocean's pH was about 8.2. However, it has now driven itself to 8.1, which, although that does not seem like a very noticeable change, it is actually a very large change when you consider the amount of carbon dioxide going into the ocean as a result of, you know, the burning of fossil fuels and other human activities. The ocean is arguably the largest carbon sink on Earth. It absorbs approximately 30 to 50 percent or 2 billion tons of carbon dioxide every year. Subsequently, carbon dioxide will react with seawater and break down to form carbonic acid, H2CO3. The pH of the oceans, like I said, has decreased as a result, which unfortunately makes it less suitable for calcite and aragonite-based organisms such as corals and other mollusks. What this does is it will eventually start to break down their calcium structures and eventually damage and even kill the corals residing on the reef. It also hinders the structural integrity, making it a lot more difficult for the corals to actually form their calcite structures in the first place. So the primary focus of the presentation is about climate change, as this is where most of the genetic-based research is going into at the moment. On average, the ocean temperatures are rising at an average about 0.12 degrees Celsius per decade since 2000 and have overall risen on an average degree of 1.5 degrees Celsius worldwide since 1900. Corals are typically stenothermal, meaning that they usually only tolerate a very narrow range of temperatures. Heat stress will cause the corals to react reject their symbiotic zooxanthellae, eventually causing them to bleach and starve. A misconception that most people have about coral bleaching is that as soon as a coral ejects its algae, it will die. That's not actually true. The coral itself will remain living for a le um, limited amount of time before it ends up dying as a result of the lack of um, photosynthesis going on with the algae. The coral itself is its own organism. What the zooxanthellae is are primarily a modified type of dinoflagellate in the genus Symbiotium, and they will reside within the tissues of the coral polyp and provide extra met metabolic energy while performing photosynthesis in exchange for some benefit of not having to gather as much energy or having to expend more resources. Although this is considered to be a symbiotic relationship, it's much more beneficial for the corals, and as such, it's very vital that they maintain these relationships because most shallow water corals are completely dependent on their zooxanthellae. Reproductive patterns are also hindered by heat stress. Corals undergo a process called synchronized spawning, where once a year on a certain night, you may have heard, that the entire reef will give off chemical signals to spawn at once. All species will do it, and every organism on that reef is going to reproduce. It's a very important process because this is really their primary more, um, mode of reproduction. And other than fragmenting and budding, this is not as common nor as obviously abundant because when the entire reef is spawning at the same time, it does so in order to maximize the possible chances of new corals forming and being born. The problem is when we have issues with climate change, we believe that these chemical signals are triggered by the temperature as it typically occurs at one day in August worldwide. But if climate change is affecting the average rate of temperatures, it's becoming more harder to predict when these coral spawnings will happen and even the amount of um, planula being released. The planula are basically what we would call a coral zygote. So that's just when egg and sperm meets and you get a planula, which will drift in the ocean water column for some time before settling on an area that it believes other members of its species are. But because of climate change, it's actually getting harder, just like I said, to predict when this will happen and the actual amount of offspring being released.
So here is a graph from the House Father et al. study from 2017. The comparison of different ERSST v3b, ERSST v4, buoy only, and CCISST monthly anomalies from January 1997 to December 2015, restricting all series to a common average. So as we can see, we have the baseline of zero degrees right here in Celsius. Um, even though there is going to be a lot of fluctuations as the ocean is a very large, you know, open system that can maintain a lot of different temperature ranges, on average, it has been trending upwards over the past two decades. And now we are seeing that temperature change of approximately 0.5 degrees Celsius right up there at top. So another major issue that corals are facing is habitat degradation and pollution. Reefs are damaged both by chemical and nutrient pollution or eutrophication and physical pollution as well. The debris, anchor drops, and ghost fishing gear get on reefs and will damage coral structures. One of the most unfortunate ways that coral, or coral reefs get damaged is surprisingly through ecotourism. When people are not careful about where they go on reefs and where they're allowed to be, unfortunately, when they go to drop their anchors on the reef, they end up damaging a lot of coral. So it's very important to be paying attention to your local area's laws and accessibility areas, because there are some areas on the reef you're not allowed to go, but of course, people will want to go anyways. And it's very important to make sure that you're in an area where your presence is not going to actively harm that part of the reef, as they are very sensitive habitats. There's also the problem of physical debris. We are very familiar with microplastics, but there are a lot of macroplastics as well that can actually get caught and cover up the reef itself. And this is also the case with ghost fishing gear. Um, lost fishing gear makes up over half of all of the ocean pollution worldwide and is becoming a very prevalent issue as a lot of that line and hooks will get caught on the reefs themselves and end up smothering them. The majority of coral species worldwide require oligotrophic or nutrient-poor water conditions in order to thrive. So part of what makes the corals themselves so um, sensitive is like I said before, they tend to only tolerate a narrow range of temperature variation. They require like very specific water conditions. In this case, they prefer water with as few nutrients as possible. They are also very particular about salinity levels. They are stenohaline as well, which means the same thing, narrow saltwater tolerance. And nutrient and physical pollutions will not only stress the corals, but it hinders sunlight accessibility as well via algae blooms or physical blockage and smothering. So like I had mentioned, reefs can get smothered when things get caught on them, but when there is an abundance of surface water algae blooming due to, as a result of nutrient pollution, those algae are going to be able to get all of the sunlight that the coral reef will need in order to um, go through photosynthesis. If they're not getting that, this is going to stress out the corals and they're going to lose a significant portion of their metabolic necessities. So how can DNA barcoding kind of help alleviate this problem? This is what we'd use to understand coral genomes. This is a relatively new technique for coral research and reef conservation as a whole. It is still being widely developed by a variety of organizations across the globe. Some of them are based here in Florida, many are based in Australia, in the Philippines, just everywhere. It's a very important worldwide collaborative project that is in the works right now. Um, they're actually in the process right now of setting up a website-based database with the Smithsonian in Washington, DC. Um, I checked the link, it's not currently up yet, but I will send it out after this anyway, just so people like know where to reference it. But the importance of this collaborative project is so that these comparisons are streamlined and are able to be made on a much quicker basis as climate change is rapidly beginning to occur worldwide and corals are already significantly stressed. It is believed upwards of 90% of all reefs on Earth are currently experiencing um, 
death events in which they might be bleaching, they may be being damaged. There's just not a lot of healthy, viable reef left. And this is subsequently going to affect all of the other organisms living on the reef. It is also believed that there is an estimated 25% of all life in the oceans depends on coral reefs during one part of their life stage or another. So this is not only going to have like the repercussions of losing our reefs on its own, but this will also affect nearly a vast majority of all ocean life, which is eventually going to possibly cause trophic cascades. It's going to cause, you know, fishery collapses. It's just going to be bad business all around. So it's very important that these habitats are maintained and are being used sustainably for resources as well. So kind of getting back onto the research itself, DNA barcoding has been widely used for a variety of other taxa, such as fish. There has been some points of contention with its applications on corals. As I mentioned, it's still a very new field and is rapidly evolving, but as it stands, there are a few issues that researchers are working to overcome in the meantime. Taxonomically, there has been very little genetic divergence between many coral species, making the field of view a little too narrow for the COI-5 sequences to identify. So the main problem with this is that because they are too similar, one GNA sequence alone hasn't really been enough to be make these important observations and identifications of individual species. A lot of coral species are very, very similar, even if they come from two completely different parts of the globe. They have evolved very closely together despite distance and location. So having to look through only one lens hasn't really been adequate enough in identifying and making all of the necessary arrangements for each coral species taxonomically. So what they are now doing is they are trying to use multiple loci and to consider for further analysis. So they are looking at different strands as well in order to try and piece together a more accurate picture of each individual species. It's just a little bit more work because they have to find other suitable loci as well. So they are still in the process of picking out key uh, gene sequences, but they've already made a lot of progress on that, which is very good. So like I said, many coral reef species are still taxonomically unclear due to limited analysis. So even though we may have a species down to its species and genus, it might not actually be that taxonomically clear. We can identify the individual species, but we may have its order, it may be even its class completely wrong. Sometimes the genus is completely wrong as well. Many of these species have evolved look-alike techniques in their own structure and even genetic structure as well. So it takes a lot of analysis. Most coral species on Earth have actually had to be reevaluated multiple times over the course since their first discoveries and identifications in the 19th and 20th centuries. So even today, we're still seeing very prominent and not like noteworthy species being discovered again or having their tax taxonomy refined too. The morphological approach has also proven to be inadequate, as like I said, many of the species have convergently evolved. They're all very similar, so even just looking at them, it's going to be very difficult to tell which species is which, even when you're looking at a limited view as such like a single region or a single quadrant on a map. So there are a lot of benefits of using DNA barcoding DB in reef conservation, despite its only fledgling status. DBC adds new tools and protocols for handling samples. So for most researchers, the quality of the sample is absolutely vital. If the sample is damaged or hindered in any way, that might make its viability completely unusable. It might muddy the water too much and thus make the species it belongs to unidentifiable, even if it's just a minor problem. The protocol will also allow for a higher quality curation of voucher specimens as well. So what I do as a part of my collaboration with the research teams involved in projects like this is I help curate and rate, you know, culture a lot of specimens that are used for both research as well as outplanting restoration efforts. Um, I previously worked with Moat down in Summerland Key, 
which they have a, they just actually finished their on land coral nursery as well. And they are also responsible for a lot of out planting efforts down in the Florida Keys. So taking care of these specimens is of utmost priority because these are quite literally the future of reef conservation. These are going to be the org- like the individuals that will try and make up all of the reef that has been lost due to degradation, pollution, climate change, all of that. So it's very important that not only do we understand the individuals that we're out planting, but also make sure that they're at their best that they can possibly be because they're going up against all of these issues by themselves. So another bonus of DBC and reef conservation is it limits the costs of transportation and is more readily available to researchers. As I said, this is a highly collaborative effort, so making all of this data as accessible as possible to researchers across the globe is vital. In order to help do this, it creates a much clearer picture that can be understood in pretty much as few layman's terms as possible. Most metazoans are impractical to use as specimens due to their size, but this is not necessarily the case for coral polyps. A lot of gene strands have been easily identified and isolated so that researchers know exactly what they're looking for when monitoring and studying coral fragments as well as the polyps themselves. Transportation of specimens is also streamlined with reduced risks of specimen damage or death. Like I had mentioned, it's very delicate to make sure that your specimen does not get damaged and that your DNA strand is as intact as physically possible, as this is quite literally the difference between viability and a waste. It's very important to know exactly what you're looking at and any damages can just make that impossible. So this process has allowed for a lot of online databases to be made. And as a result, this has made the need for transportation much less necessary, as well as creating a online database can help secure that information for a much longer period of time. Some of the current DBC uses in coral reef conservation are the DNA microarrays and RT-PCR or real-time PCR are being employed for sampling and identifying hybrids alongside the COI5 strands. So another interesting thing about corals is that they do have a high tendency to hybridize. There are many hybrid species even where I live. One of them to note is Acropora palmetto, which is, it's a hybrid between staghorn and elkhorn coral, and it forms a widespread branching coral. Um, It looks kind of like shelves. So the thing about that, however, is that Even though it's become its own species, the species that it's a resulting hybrid of are already imperiled. So it's very important, like I said, to identify as many of these species as possible before one or another go extinct, as they are at a very high likelihood of doing so. The example I mentioned about Acropora um, palamita is that one of its parent corals, Acropora... um, Well, I'm forgetting the genus, sorry. Um, This elkhorn coral, right? The elkhorn coral has already been taken into captivity. Most of the remaining specimens are actually some of the last living specimens from the wild. So in recent years, as a result of um, stony coral tissue loss disease outbreak that we had in Florida, almost the entire population of remaining elkhorn coral had to be taken into captivity in order to preserve the species. So it is very vital that this is done as quickly as possible and using dbc has allowed researchers to streamline this process as i said by using crispr and cas9 technologies researchers are beginning to understand how to modify specific heat tolerance related gene sequences and identifying how they vary species to species this is probably the most ideal method of using crispr and cas9 technologies that we have Ideally, corals already have built-in heat tolerance genes. This is what signals when they are stressed and what tells them to eject their corals. So ideally, what researchers are looking to do is that they are seeking to be able to identify which gene sequences those are and modify them so that they can potentially raise the limits that these um, genes can tolerate. 
So even though it seems a bit more bleak in stopping climate change, or at least reversing the damage that's already been done, they're trying to raise that tolerance so that corals will be able to adapt and continue to thrive despite changing conditions. It's also important, like I said, to identify these gene strands species to species because there is a high amount of variation, like I said. Even though they are very, very similar, they're all like very different genetically. So it has to be important for researchers to be able to quickly identify which is which and which resources they need to use while dealing with that species. With this, they will likely determine how each species you know, react to heat stress and modify them to become more tolerant, as I'd said. So here is a picture of some fragments that I got to work with recently. Um, these were all ready to be outplanted after about a month of curation. Um, these are some of the, they're from the genus Corallinium. So they're not quite native to Florida, but they are native to the Mediterranean. They were a highly coveted genus of bright red corals that grow in relatively deep waters that were over harvested in the 1300s to the 1700s as a result of the jewelry trade because they continue to keep that brilliant red coloration to them. So this is part of some of the restoration efforts in Portugal to help restore some of their reefs that had been over harvested as some of these species made a reappearance after a long time of not having been recorded. So this is an effort to help restore those corals as well. Something else to note about the coral restoration efforts, however, is that not all coral reefs are as equally imperiled as others. While most of the reefs in Florida where I live are very much imperiled and are very damaged, there are other reefs in the world that are very much in better condition and are still continuing to thrive, which have also been the focus of researchers to see how they are managing to do this despite the changing climate and identifying the ways that they have been continuing to thrive. So in the case of these corals, as I mentioned, they are a fairly deep water species being found about two to 300 meters deep in the Mediterranean. They aren't as susceptible to climate change as shallow water corals are because the surface, or not the surface temperature, but the temperature of the water much deeper down tends to stay at a relative temperature of four degrees Celsius. There's much less variation there. So a lot of the corals down there are not seeing the same effects as corals on near the surface are. But that's not to say they aren't facing their own threats as well. So, like I said, batches of coral frags for research and restorative purposes. There are problems with this, though. Although several heat-tolerant genes were identified using CRISPR and Cas9 tech, the study was only a proof of principle and did not yield any positive results. Corals with modified gene sequences became more intolerant to heat stress than those that were unmodified at the time of the study from 2018. So what this means is that even though they were able to identify and modify the specific heat tolerance genes in a given species of coral, it actually had the inverse effect where instead of making it more tolerant, it made them less tolerant, which is obviously the opposite of what they're trying to accomplish. But at the very least, it proved that they could do this there actually is a method of adequately editing genes in corals so that it does have a different effect. Albeit it wasn't the desired effect in the case of this study, but that's why we continue to have research and further development along the line. So as I said, this was only in 2018 when they figured out that they could do this. So it is still a very new fledgling field of study in coral conservation. Despite the disheartening results, like I said, we now know that it is possible to modify these gene sequences. And using DBC has helped isolate and identify these strands, as well as their functions and differences between coral species. Not every gene sequence is going to be the same, and they are each going to have their own different responses, despite the level of synchronicity they have. So what will be important is knowing which species to identify and which ones we can modify. This is part of that streamlined process in figuring out which ones are in need of help more than the others. So while we want to help as many as possible, there is going to have to be an order of 
methods here where we're going to have to identify which ones are the most at risk and which ones are the most stable. So you're going to see that kind of where the ones that are most at risk are going to be receiving the most attention, while the ones that are more stable at least have a little more time to try and adapt and aren't at, as at risk as these ones are. Because as I said, many species are imperiled and are considered critically endangered. So it's a very much a matter of like urgently. But there is still hope for the future. Now that researchers are developing ways to edit and identify coral gene sequences, there is more hope for the future of reef conservation. Technology will continue to be tweaked and made more efficient, as well as lead to more discoveries being made. The allowance of gene identification using DVC has already led to many important discoveries about corals and nature of their taxonomy. Thus, this has given researchers the opportunity to further investigate how genes play a role in the environmental tolerance of corals. With this in mind, it may be possible someday soon to effectively boost tolerance levels in corals worldwide and help restore our reefs in a face of a changing climate. So that's kind of the end of my slideshow. Do you guys have questions for me that I can help answer? I will go through the chat right now. But feel free to put, you know, stuff in lectures and conferences as well. So I can read questions from there in lecture conferences. Yeah, no, of course. Thank you for having me. All right, so we have a question from Kraken. Do corals have either six or eight tentacles and are anemones corals or the ones that look like brains? So corals are identified with their polyp type, which like I said, polyps are, they kind of look like anemones because they're the same shape. And it, they do only have the six or eight. That is the primary identifier, but there are some that may have less. Those are anomalies. And that's kind of why I mentioned it's a bit tricky with the taxonomy because they still haven't been properly classified. Yes, yeah, so anemones are not corals. They are anthozoans, which, you know, it means flower animal, but they're not in the same order or class. Well, they're in the same class, just not the same order. <laughs> Sorry. So anemones are their own organism, but the ones that look like brains are a type of scleractinian stony coral. Um, those tend to be in the genus uh, Montreosa. So like one of the most like, you know, notable brain corals, Montreosa cavernosa, which is the massive brain coral you see that can get very big, like wider than five feet. They're huge. So yeah, so there's a lot of variability as well. So what is actually eroding the coral? Is it the temperature shift or the pollution? If so, what pollutants are they? Right. So what actually erodes the coral is the release of carbonic acid into the water column. That is the um, product of carbon dioxide reacting to seawater. Um, what carbonic acid does is it dissolves the calcite and aragonite structure that forms the coral themselves. So it's essentially dissolving them. If you've ever done the experiment where you put a seashell in vinegar and watch it dissolve, it's the same concept because those are very similar um, new, like minerals being used. Yeah. Um, is there any hypothesis as to why gene editing resulted in the opposite effect they expected? Yes, so one of the ideas that they had for why it worked in the complete opposite one, um, the reason it had the opposite effect was because the corals themselves didn't respond to it adequately. So the process of editing their genes actually kind of stressed them out, and it made them eject their zooxanthellae at a faster rate than they normally would, which is kind of why they believe 
that the heat tolerance had gone down because when placed in the same warm temperatures for the study, they ejected it at a much faster rate than they had before. So if I remember correctly, when you had mentioned DBC, you mentioned a protein for which the DNA sequence is used for the barcoding. Is there any reason why that protein was selected? Yes. So that particular protein was selected because they feel it serves as a very strong baseline for most taxa. This is why they use it with microbes, fish, algae, and are trying to use it with the corals as well. Um, that particular protein tends to be very identifiable and unique to each organism. So they feel that there wasn't initially supposed to be a lot of overlap. But what they are seeing is there actually is quite a bit of overlap, which is why they're now reaching out with other DNA sequences to try and identify them better. Um, what got me into corals in the first place? I've lived in South Florida my entire life, and the Florida Reef Tract is the third largest reef tract in the world, so it's always been a part of my life, and I've always had a love of the ocean. Um, when I was younger, I didn't really know what I wanted to study, but as time went on and I learned more, I realized I just really want to study coral reef ecology and go into the conservation efforts as well. Mm hmm I think I have a question in the other chat. I don't know how to get there, though. There it is. Okay. Oh, yeah, never mind. I answered that one. Sorry. Okay. Let's see. So I mentioned the brilliant red coral used in jewelry. Is coral considered a cosmetic luxury? It definitely can be. Um, even the ones that don't have those kinds of pigments that the brilliant red corals do. Corals were used as decoration pieces for a very long time. Even today, I'm sure you can still go to a gift shop somewhere and find like a large chunk of a coral colony for sale as like a decoration. So in recent years, the harvesting of most of these species has become completely illegal. You cannot harvest them for any circumstances outside of research. So that is kind of why it's a lot better to, um, you know, work with aquaculture so that you're not having to harvest those corals. But for a long time, for centuries, they were very coveted. Um, let's see. Could you perhaps mention any other protein sequences they might target in corals during DBC? That's a good question. Um, uh, you know, I'm not sure. Um, I'm going to have to look at that again because I was mostly familiar with the one I meant. But because it's kind of like I said, it's still being explored right now. So there's a lot of like different opinions on what they should be looking at. So it's a little unclear for me at the moment. Is there anything wrong with harvesting dead coral from the beach? So I know most people do it because it's like, oh, I picked it up. But technically, you're not supposed to. I think in some places, there are laws that prevent people from harvesting even dead coral structures because those can be repurposed in the ocean, you know, through their own processes. But it's like, it's dead. So I don't know. It's, it's something that everyone does, but nobody actually thinks that it's illegal. But it's, it depends where you are. Is there a term for multi-loci barcoding? I believe there is. Um, what they would call it is the multi-locus DNA barcoding. So it's basically just called that multi-locus. You could also use meta barcoding as well. Is it possible to revive dead coral or are they far too damaged to nourish back to health? It actually is possible to revive them. Um, like I had said, right after a coral bleaching event happens where it ejects its zoosanthelae, you'll notice that it's still a bright white skeleton. If that skeleton doesn't have algae surrounding it or encompassing it, that means that the coral polyps are actually still alive. It is possible to take that colony and bring it to an environment where it's less stressed and actually reintroduce the zooxanthellae back into it because they may begin to accept them again. It's just unfortunately, as they continue to get stressed out, they're less likely to do so, which is why in the wild, you'll see them just bleach and end up dying. 
but it is possible to revive them after a certain point. Mm -hmm. Are there any reproductive issues with the new genetically modified corals? Actually, that is something I should have mentioned. Quite the opposite. They recently found out with the staghorn coral, Acropora cervicornis, how to trigger its re reproductive um, signal. So they were able to actually synthetically get it to breed for the first time ever. And this is huge because, like, like I said, it was super hard to figure out exactly when they were going to spawn and what triggered those signals. But now that researchers have been able to do this synthetically, they may be able to trigger a higher level of breeding events so that they can help restore and combat the loss of reefs we're seeing. Mm -hmm. How would the ecosystem be if- I'm sorry, my dog just took my laptop. <laughs> How would the ecosystem be affected if all of the corals were gone? What major changes are we likely to see? So these are going to be some devastating effects worldwide. As I mentioned before, coral reefs serve as an important habitat or shelter for approximately 25% of all life in the oceans. A bulk of this being invertebrate, but many of these being commercially vital fishes. So we're going to be seeing a huge loss in biodiversity, which unfortunately will create more susceptible environments. We're going to see fishery collapses, and we're going to see a lot of mass extinction events as well if reefs are no longer viable. If they're so closely related, are they able to hybridize? They are. So I did say, I, sorry, I had mentioned this a little bit before, but corals actually do tend to hybridize, which is surprising because you would think that they would try to be as different as possible with the, the amount of variation they have. But the reason why some of this initial um, genetic barcoding was difficult was because they didn't realize how prominent some of the hybrids were. A lot of the hybrids were actually classified as a single species. So what we didn't realize was a completely new species they thought was just something else looking a little bit different. That's kind of why it's taken so long, because they didn't really have the necessary materials to properly identify them. So there is a lot of hybridization as well. but heat tolerance isn't propagating through the hybrids? It kind of is. So in some studies, they are suggesting that there is a bit of heat tolerance beginning to appear. Um, unfortunately, it's a bit tricky to say like how well they're doing it because it is very much a case-by-case -case basis. So they are trying to investigate some of the corals that are developing heat-resistant strategies. Um, one of these that they found out, like, several years ago was how the staghorn coral, when it feels like it's being directly affected by the heat, it will turn a bright purple color. That's kind of its last line of defense, but it has been shown to extend the life expectancy of an afflicted coral for a significantly longer amount of time, up to a few months. So if they continue to develop adaptations like this, there may be more hope but they're still investigating what those adaptations are right now. So it really just depends. So does coral live and survive where the sunlight doesn't reach? Yes. So corals have been found to be as deep as 2,000 meters, which is well below the range of sunlight. This is part of the um, mesopelagic zone. So the difference between corals that live without sunlight is that, like I mentioned, they tend to have fewer but much larger polyps that are more specialized in what is more typical of a cnidarian filter feeding. So they'll look more like an anemone on their polyps than a regular coral polyp would, but those ones that are that deep don't utilize photosynthesis because there isn't really any available light. 
So they depend solely on filter feeding and deposit feeding. Is it possible that the genetically modified corals are stressed because they're not in their natural environment? Yes, that was something that they determined to likely have been true. Even though they really tried to replicate the environment as close as they could, it was just a bit stressful for them. And unfortunately, they weren't used to having that gene. It's, it's a bit strange, but they were able to identify that something was wrong with them, so they killed themselves. What do you do with a dead coral? What are their functions? So there isn't really a ton that you can do with a dead coral structure. Um, really, its primary function at that point is to just fully break down and return to part of the sediment on the reef. Um, sediment deposition is really important as you're, it needs to be able to be controlled because what we're also seeing is that as a result of a lot of corals dying and dissolving, there's too much sediment being added back to the reef, which does account for some of the smothering we're seeing. So there isn't really a lot you can do with the dead coral. You're just supposed to leave it. Yeah, so it's mostly just return to sediment, basically. Mm-hmm. Of course. Any other questions? I see typing. Mm-hmm. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, if there are no more questions, I'd really like to thank Ashby for this excellent presentation. Um, I'd also like to remind everybody that um, the summer conference will be the first weekend of September. And if you're interested in presenting or even donating um, to for the stuff that we need for the conference, uh, there are links in the announcements channel. Uh, thank you again, Ashby, for this wonderful presentation. Of course. Anytime. And thank you, everybody in the audience, for attending and asking great questions.